Coming up on this episode of Silent Cities. I get a sense of the sheer scale and power of the machine that 617 Squadron would have had to fly in order to complete their mission. There's no denying they were all experienced pilots, but they must have been under so much pressure. Yes, well, you're seeing your friends being shot down and dying all around you. The risks were incredible. Flying across heavily defended positions to bomb enemy targets. We've come to the iconic Runnymede Memorial, one of many Commonwealth War Grave Commission sites across the world, to discover more about one of the most daring raids of the Second World War. You might not be familiar with our work. We're often referred to as the CWGC, and we commemorate those who died in service or as a result of conflict, so that they and the human cost of war are remembered forever. Here at Runnymede, we commemorate by name over 20,000 men and women of the Air Forces who were sadly lost in the Second World War, including the men I'm looking for today. One of them should be on this panel here. Ah yes, here he is, Byers. The men who took part in the raid came from across what is now the Commonwealth, from the Canadian Vernon Byers, the Australian Dave Shannon, and Les Monroe, the New Zealander. They came from all different backgrounds, but they all came together to take part in one of the most daring raids of the Second World War. Now, Vernon Byers took part in Operation Chastise, of course, more famously known as the Dam Busters Raid. And at the CWGC, we remember Byers and all the other air crew who sadly did not return. We share their stories and remember their sacrifice. And we're going to talk about the immense challenges they must have faced over 80 years ago. It's easy to forget that some of these men were barely into their 20s and already taking on so much responsibility. I cannot imagine what the parents of those boys must have felt like. I myself, I'm a mum and my eldest is a teenager. It's so frightening to think that in a few years time he could be taking on something as momentous and risky as this. 80 years ago, in spring 1943, Nazi Germany was far from being beaten but the tide was beginning to turn against the Axis forces. Allied troops were on their way to liberating North Africa, planning was underway for a large amphibious landing on mainland Europe, and the battle in the Atlantic continued to rage. Back in 1940, things were very different. Europe was falling and Britain was in retreat, forced back across the Channel. It was at this time that seeds of a plan to hit back at Germany began to develop in the mind of engineer and inventor Barnes Wallace. It would take Wallace's ingenuity and the bravery and skill of the RAF to breach the dams and damage the Axis war effort, demonstrating that Britain could strike at the very heart of the enemy. We've come to beautiful Wales to find out more about Operation Chastise and to reflect on what it must have been like for those young men with so much responsibility placed on them, their mission to strike a massive blow against Nazi Germany. Such a fascinating story, isn't it? It's almost Hollywood-esque. You've got the new weapon, the Lancasters, the courageous men flying at almost impossibly low heights across Nazi Europe to smash the very symbols of German industrial might. It has it all, doesn't it? It really does. People might be wondering what the connection is between the Dambuster story and Wales. Of course, not many people know about the connection. I mean, you might think about RAF Scampton, of course, or the Peak District where they practiced, the beaches in Kent. But it's actually here in Wales where the first work on what would become upkeep or the bouncing bomb of course the bouncing bomb actually happened and we're going to go and see some of the remnants of the dam that was exploded during that work let's go and take a look why not wow this dam although relatively small was the perfect place for the testing and the development of what would become upkeep, the bouncing bomb. Barnes Wallace was an exceptional engineer. He was the one that came up with the idea to bounce a bomb 
over the torpedo nets and smash them into the dam's walls themselves. And of course, it had to be dropped on exceptionally low height. The plan was incredibly risky and so many things could go wrong with it. And that was assuming that they could even get to the target area, the heartland of industrial Germany. And they knew that to use this new weapon, they had to do it as soon as possible. Spring 1943, when the water levels at the dams were at their highest. The hope was, of course, that the raid would have a devastating impact on the German war effort and morale, and that this in turn would speed up the end of the war. Following Barnes Wallace's successful lobbying, 617 Squadron was formed in March 1943, just two months before the raid on the German dams. Specially modified Lancaster bombers were designed to carry the new upkeep bomb, and the squadron soon began high intensity, low altitude night training. Three targets were selected, the Mona, the Eder, and the Sork Dams. The timing of the raid was as crucial and complex as the concept of the raid itself. Contingent on factors including weather and the ability to supply the modified Lancasters. Of course, Guy Gibson was absolutely central to the Dambusters raid. He was already an experienced pilot and he was just 23 years old. His job was to lead the raid, but he only had weeks to form and train his new squadron. Yeah, I remember most of the air crew that signed up had already completed at least one full tour of nighttime bombing raids. There's no denying they were all experienced pilots, but they must have been under so much pressure. Yes, well, you're seeing your friends being shot down and dying all around you. The risks were incredible, flying across heavily defended positions to bomb enemy targets. It's no wonder that during the whole war, 51% of air crew on bombing operations were killed. And it's hard to imagine just how much courage that would have taken. But I like to think that it's the work that we do at the CWGC, that we remember their courage, their sacrifice, every single day. That's right, and it's through memorials such as at Runnymede and throughout the world that we're able to commemorate those whose bodies were sadly never recovered. This is what we do best, sharing their stories. Despite only finding out about the targets hours before, on the night of the 16th of May, 19 Lancaster bombers took off from RAF Scampton. Flying in three separate waves, they crossed into Europe and came under heavy fire and the first casualties were sadly lost. Squadron leader Guy Gibson led the charge. It was his aircraft that was first to attack the Mona, but it took five more aircraft before it was breached. The remaining crews turned their sights on the Eda, which finally collapsed at 1.52 a.m. Meanwhile, aircraft from the other ways bombed the Sort, but it remained intact. As the surviving crews made their way home, they came under more fire, and more lives were lost. Even though the raid was a success and an amazing feat of ingenuity and bravery on behalf of Wallace and the air crew, breaching those two dams took a really heavy toll on 617 Squadron. Absolutely, and as we saw at Runnymede, of course, uh, Vernon Byers and his crew were the first to be shot down as they reached Europe, and sadly their bodies were never recovered. Uh, except for Flight Sergeant James McDull, whose, uh, whose body was recovered, and he's now buried at Harlingen General Cemetery. Yes, in the Netherlands, where he's commemorated by us. And in fact, at this cemetery, there are 67 Commonwealth burials, and the majority of them are airmen. It's so central to what we do, isn't it? Commemorating those who lost their lives in service, from the small curated cemetery to the great massive memorials across the world. Of course, our reflection on the Dambuster story wouldn't be complete without a visit to a real life Lancaster bomber. So I've come to the Lincolnshire Aviation Heritage Centre, right in the heart of Bomber Command country, to have a look at the linchpin of the Dambusters raid. It feels like a huge privilege to be standing so close to the mighty Lancaster bomber. Although this particular Lancaster was not used in the Dambusters raid, sadly none of those planes exist today. 
I get a sense of the sheer scale and power of the machine that 617 Squadron would have had to fly in order to complete their mission. Standing here now, it's hard to imagine how 617 Squadron would have felt as they set off on their night raid across Europe. I think about my own son, of course, and some of the crew of a Lancaster wouldn't have been much older than him. I dread to think how vulnerable they must have felt in the pitch dark, in freezing conditions, and flying at incredibly low altitude, which of course would have made it all the more risky. It is really hard to imagine just how brave they would have been. And this is what it's all about, an upkeep mine or bouncing bomb. At the time, this was state-of-the-art technology, but it would have been up to 617 Squadron to work as a team and drawn all their skills as pilots to deliver it effectively on target. So our reflection on the Dam Busters raid has taken us to Wales, we visited Runnymede, but the absolute highlight of the entire journey has to be sitting in the cockpit of an actual Lancaster bomber. And I'm here with Tim, who's a volunteer tour guide at East Kirkby, and we're gonna talk a bit about what it must have been like for the crew of a Lancaster about to set off on a night mission across Europe. So the seven-man crew in the, in the Lancaster was uh, throughout the aircraft from the tail gunner down the back right to the bomb aimer down underneath your feet from the pilot's position. And um, we're generally going to be flying our operational sorties at night, so it's going to be pitch black. We can't let light out of the aircraft or else we become a target uh, for German night fighters or flak uh, pickup. Um, so the aircraft is dark. So we're in this tight claustrophobic space, um, which for down the back is pitch black. They're knowing their way around the aircraft by touch and feel and from the extensive training that they have done. Once the aircraft starts to become alive, the pilot and the engineer start to form the engines, uh, the noise and the vibration from those start to kick in. When you're taking off, the whole airframe starts to move and vibrate and that's going to increase as you're climbing up towards your target. When you're over target and the Germans start firing the flak, we're used to seeing in the films the explosions and the light, um, but the veterans talk about the, the shrapnel from that flak tinkling off the skin of the aircraft if it's not too close, mm -hmm. um, adding to their fear and, and, uh, and worry. Uh, and of course, if it was close enough, it's going to rupture the aircraft and potentially injure, injure the crew members. The pilot as the captain is just one part. They're all reliant on each other for their survival and the or success or otherwise of the operational sortie. That's right, and it's only sitting here now that you realise exactly how claustrophobic this environment is. I mean, it was very difficult to even get from the door of the Lancaster to sit in the cockpit, you have to duck and be very careful where you're walking, it's not, it's not easy at all. Um, and as Tim says, the sensory overload that those men would have suffered, and it's easy to forget, of course, that they would have just been in their 20s, some of them. It's been really interesting to hear about what the crew would have gone through when flying on the Lancaster. So thank you very much, Tim, for, um, for your time and for sharing this information with us. Well, it's been an amazing experience to learn more of the stories of sacrifice and how we commemorate these incredibly brave young men. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission continues to commemorate the men of 617 Squadron alongside the 1.7 million men and women of the Commonwealth who lost their lives during the World Wars. You can find out more about our work and those we commemorate at cwgc.org.